powerful message from God himself. He just uses my voice. So open up your ears and open up your spiritual ears to hear what God has to say. And we also want to make an announcement that those of you who are watching, let your friends know so we can get more people in on uh, Oasis of Life Ministries broadcast so that we can... You have to follow. Following. We, yeah, well, I'm sure it's from the crowd here. So we have to have a following in order to go back live on... Facebook. So let some people know. We're glad you're joining us, but let some people know so we can get back live and minister <coughs> to the masses out there. So right now, Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you this morning. We praise you for the time we've had together to come and praise and worship. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we worship you as our Heavenly Father. We thank you now for your word. Holy Spirit, my voice is your voice this morning. Use my voice to present God's word that he would have presented this morning to these marvelous, wonderful, precious people. And that, Father, this word goes out and not only will it touch the born-again believers, but it will touch those who have yet to hear and see that Jesus is Lord and that you, as Heavenly Father, our love. They need that love. Let them see it through us today. Let it touch their heart and bring them into the kingdom of God. Father, we thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 5, and if you'll allow me this morning, I'm going to do probably from a, from a teaching standpoint this morning. So, verse 14, but strong need belongs to them that are of full age, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The Bible tells us that in the last days that the world will call good evil and evil good. Amen. And we're seeing that in volumes out there. <clears throat> so we as the church We've got to understand good from evil. Good is God. Evil is Satan. But we've got to know who's supplying what to us. All good gifts, James said, all good gifts come from the Father above. So if it's not a good gift, it's not from the Father. It's not from heaven. It's not from Jesus. Right? So, when we look at it, and we were talking about this in the Bible study this morning, anything that involves the curse of the law is not good. It's not from God. If it were good, why did Jesus redeem us from that curse? Yes. Amen. Amen. I mean, sometimes we just, folks, we got to stop and think sometimes. <laughs> I know that's kind of hard sometimes, but sometimes we got to stop and think. Push the world out of our mind and think about what God says and who God is and what he wants for us. See, Satan wants to destroy you. God wants to love you Amen. and build your life and give you life more abundantly. That's what Jesus said. He said, I came to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. It's time as the body of Christ we start living in that abundant life. Instead of fighting it and arguing with it, live it. It's a good place to go. Why? Folks, when the world starts seeing the church living an abundant life, it's going to make the church draw to that abundant life because that's what they're looking for. Amen. Yeah. The 
a hurting, sick, broke world out there. The church has to pick up its level. And in order to do that, we're going to have to have the meat of the word. So, this morning I want to talk to you about the God of creation. So turn to Genesis chapter 1. If we're going to begin with God, we ought to begin in the beginning. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. But notice, nothing was happening at this point. The darkness covered it, the Holy Spirit was moving, but not working. Now listen to the next statement. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And the Hebrew text actually says, light be, light what? So as soon as God spoke, the Holy Spirit went to work. Amen. And he produced the light over the darkness. Now what was God doing here? God was removing all hindrance to what he was about to do by bringing light in the situation. God knew what he wanted, but the earth had become, and that's part of the Hebrew text, the earth had become without form and void. Let me say this very quickly here. God, don't make junk. Amen. All you English teachers just relax. <laughs> when God creates something, it's good. And if you read this whole thing in this Genesis chapter 1, you'll see that God said, and then God saw it was good. Amen. Verse for God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Now that is not the sun and the moon's creation. That came a little bit later. This was removing Satan from the situation. And folks, when we've got something in our life that looks like it's in chaos... We've got to remove the darkness. We're speaking things, but the first thing we need to do is remove that darkness. Get the darkness out. Let the light be revealed. And now we don't have, God didn't have any in interference here from Satan at that point, from that point on. And we can do the same. We have that ability to remove that darkness. And right now, it's time for us to remove the darkness from our territories. Yes. Satan doesn't own this territory. Amen. We do. Amen. And we'll, we'll see this as we go along in this. God returned the earth's authority to man through Jesus. Yes. Jesus came. He paid the price. It was over, and so was Satan. Yeah. Well, he still bothered me. He can bother us. He can come. But he ain't got nothing in us. That's right. Hallelujah. Amen? All right. Now, Satan could not operate against God's faith. How did God create this? He created it by speaking his desire in faith. This is what God wanted. What we're reading here in Genesis. Why did he want this? He was building a hole for his man. See, he got the home built. Then he put life into the man. And that's down there in Genesis 1.26. 
God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over all every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. All right? God created this for man and then gave man the authority or the dominion over the whole thing. Hallelujah. God intended to just sit back and watch man move the Garden of Eden to the rest of this world. To the rest of this earth, if you would. All right? God said, God said, God said, God said, and after every God said, it was. God spoke this world into the condition that he wanted it in that garden. It was God's dynamic, living, self-energizing, creative force of faith when it was released by God's spoken words. And let me say this right now. We have the same ability. Now, the church boss said that. But it's true. Because God made us after his likeness and in his image. And the image God used to create man was the image of himself. I like Bill Winston's uh, teaching on this. We have God's DNA. We've got his blood flowing in us. We've got his personality in us. We've got his characteristics in us. And you say, well, why aren't we getting the same results? Because we're not acting like God. We have a problem with believing that our words are going to produce something. And every time we have a problem and we need something created, or something produced, we're going before God and crying and bawling and squalling, oh God, would you take care of this situation? And God is telling us, but we got to listen. I've already done that. He's already taken care of the situation. You did so. Amen. Glory. In Hebrews, and let's go over there, Hebrews chapter 4. So that things which were are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now it wasn't made out of nothing. What we see around us was made out of God's faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when it says through faith we understand this. I heard some teaching of Charles Capps a number of years ago. There's several layers to every, every verse. And there's a couple of layers in that statement. Number one, true faith is how we understand how God made the world, but it was through God's faith that he made it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Brother Jerry, I mean, none of us can have the faith of God. Oh, yes, we can. Because God is where, who is giving us that. And faith comes from the Word of God. So it's God's faith being built in us that we need to start using and walking in, and we need to increase that faith every day. This world's getting worse and worse by the day. So what we have to do, we have to get better and better by the day. Get our faith built up every day. Amen. Amen. Most people think, well, God gave us that measure of faith, Romans 12, 3. He gave us a measure of 
the measure of faith. Well, he gave us a measure for us to build upon and grow. And think about this for a moment. That measure that he gave us got you born again. That's pretty big. That's what a work in itself. So what do you think we can do if we built our faith day in and day out? We'd be unstoppable. We'd be able to do exactly what God did. We'd see a situation that needs change, speak what God spoke about it, and it would change. You can shout it into that. All right. Man became another speaking spirit when God breathed or spoke his words into that clay that he had just formed. Genesis 2, 7, God formed this clay into a body. But then he breathed or spoke life into that body. And man became another speaking spirit. Back over to Genesis. Genesis verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So I would like to send this verse of scripture to Nancy Pelosi. And have her read it. Amen. Amen. See, there is a difference between a male and a female. And God's the one who made the difference. And I don't know about you, I'm glad he did. Amen. Amen. And God blessed them. God empowered them to succeed or to prosper. God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the face of the earth. So God formed this lifeless piece of clay, then spoke, verse 28, into that clay, and it came alive. The breath of life is still contained in God's Word. So whenever we apply the Word of God to our life, it's giving us, getting us at a higher level of life each time we do it. Go over to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. What a marvelous chapter. Currently listening to Brother David <clears throat> and his his whole message is inclining your ear to the Word of God. And there's so much in this, just these few verses. I'm trying to think. There's there's four tapes, well over six or seven hours of his teaching on just these verses. On the verses I'm about to read. It's powerful. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my saying. Let my words not depart from your eyes. Keep my words in the midst of your heart. For my words are life unto find those who find them. And look at this. Help or medicine to all your flesh. Now, we, we get some sickness or disease hitting our body. And what do we do? We go to a doctor. We need a doctor examines and then says, okay, here's some medication for that. We go to the drugstore, we buy the medication, we take it home, pay attention now, we take it home, and we set it on the 
shall until next week. What good is that medication going to do to you? None. When we leave church today, folks, going home, setting our Bible on the shelf until next Sunday is not doing us any good. You buy that medicine, you take it home, you read the dosage and how often you take it, and you take it. Well, the Bible's our medicine. It's medicine. It's health to our body. You start taking the Bible medication, and you can push the sickness and disease out of your life, out of your body, and walk in the health that God has provided for. My work, life, and help to all your flesh. Amen. But we've got to unclad our ear, we've got to attend to the Word of God. God's Word is light. And as it brings light, it increases our faith. As we increase our faith, we increase our authority. As we increase our authority, we increase our ability to overcome. So it's a process. Okay? First, we've got to increase our faith. Then we have to keep going to increase our authority. And then we finally get to the place where we get our authority, our, our faith and authority working. And we are now, as 1 John 5, 4, more than conquerors. We conquer the world through our faith. Same thing with your finances, your relationships. Whatever it might be. We were created in the very image of God, the Creator. We are now a living, speaking spirit. Now, it becomes very important that we know who God is. So let me give you what the Bible says about God. Give you these scriptures. First John 4 8 says God is love. John 4 24 says God is spirit. Adam's spirit was spawned from God's own spirit. God literally reproduced himself in Adam. How can he do that? He spoke the blessing. Genesis 1, 48, 8, that we just read. Then in 1 John chapter 1, it also tells us God is light. And there is no darkness in him. So for God to give us darkness He'd have to get it from someplace because it isn't in him. And let me give you a little hint here. The devil's the one that possesses the darkness. Amen. And God isn't going to get anything from him. Amen. God already kicked him out of heaven for his action. So why would God go back to him now and say, oh, give me a little darkness so I can get Yeah, sometimes we just got to think about these things. So God is love. God is light. God is spirit. Now, go over to Psalm chapter 8. What does God think of man? Well, God can't think much of us after all what we do. Psalm 8, 
verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who has set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and suckling has thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, and that thou mightest kill the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens and thy works of thy hands, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Now look at verse 5. For thou hast made man a little lower than the angels. Well, the, the word angels there is actually translated as Elohim. It's translated as Godhead. We haven't been made lower than the angels. We've been made lower than God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And just a little lower. It's not a big wide gap, folks. Thou hast made him a little lower than Elohim, and hast crowned man with glory and honor. honor. Listen, are you there? Verse 6. God, you made man to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under man's feet. <coughs> oh. I'm going to let that sink in for a moment. Well, does that include the devil? Yes. Does it include sickness and disease? Yes. How about lack of poverty? Yes. How about any persecution? Any type of thing that get, Satan's trying to get to us? Oppression? It's all under our feet. Yes. In other words, we're stomping on that stuff. Or you can even say, we're making that a resting stool. We got our feet on it. That I have a problem with all this stuff. So I'm resting in what God has told me. What God has shown me. This is God. Well, what happened? Well, we know. Adam, although he's created in the likeness of image of God, somehow he lost his ability to see God for who he was. When Satan began to talk to Eve and then tempt her with eating the fruit from the tree of life, Satan told her that God lied to her. And said, when you eat of that fruit, you become gods, and God doesn't want you to do that. They were already like God. Confusion started to set in. And here's big man Adam watching his woman with this fruit in her hand going to eat it, and Adam just stood there and watched it. And I, this is my personal opinion. He's looking at that. Well, I wonder if God did lie and tell me the truth. I'll know as soon as she eats it. He didn't trust God at that point. Well, she took a bite out of that fruit. And in the natural, it looked like nothing happened. God wasn't trying to find them. He 
was trying to get Adam to reveal where he was to himself. He got to hell. Well, we were afraid. And we were naked, so we hid. Who told you that? That's what God asked. Who told you that? They lost the glory through their sin. And here's the thing about God. What did he do? He shed the blood of man on removed their fur from them, and covered Adam and Eve. Now, with this one, Christ fell. But Eve, Brother Jerry, was supposed to walk, walk around naked. Uh, don't do that unless you cover with the glory completely. <laughs> So here they are covered with animal skin that God had shed blood for them in order for God to forgive them and help them live, but he had to move them out of the garden. Because at this point, if they'd stayed in the garden and eating, eating fruit from the tree of life, they would have lived forever in that sinful state. So God moved them out of the garden and set them out there. And the minute you read that, you find out that the rest of the world is full of thorns and thistles. They now have to live by the sweat of their brow. Until there was a man by the name of Jesus who came into this world to save us. And to save us all from our sins. And get us back into a place where we're supposed to be living in that garden. In the Garden of Eden. Let's take a look at Jesus this morning. What did Jesus give us? Well, let's take a look. Go to Luke chapter. chapter 10, Jesus talking in verse 19, says, Behold, now let me read, read the, let's go back to verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. Now he hadn't even gone to the cross yet, and his name was still Father. And he said unto them, Jesus said unto the seventy, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now that first power I give unto you, power, can be translated authority. I give unto you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions. And in Revelation chapter uh, 12, it states that Satan, the enemy, is related to dragons, serpents, devils. All right? And we have the power of authority over that. Jesus gave it to us. Just like Adam, when he bowed his knee to Satan, he gave him the dominion that God had given Adam. And Satan at one point said, I have the authority over this whole thing because it was given to me. Luke chapter 4. So now Jesus has taken that authority back and given it to man, where God intended it to be. So we have this authority. Well, what else did he give us? Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 
Corinthians chapter 6. Let me start in verse 10 here. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And that word power there, again, can be related to faith. It can be related to authority. Put on, wait a minute, you put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now this is where we start looking at the meat of a word. Lori's little granddaughter there. What is she now? Most people are four months old. Wow. <laughs> Time flies when you have fun. <laughs> She's four years old. Lori's still dressing her. Is she dressing herself yet? No. Four no. months. Lori's still dressing her. Feeding her. But there's going to come a time, hopefully, <laughs> that she won't have to do that anymore. That this little girl will learn to eat by herself and dress herself. So you put on the armor of God is a growth thing in the Bible. You put it on. God says, I'm not dressing you. You wear what you want, but I'm recommending spiritually you put on my armor. So what did Jesus give us? The armor of God. Right? He's given us authority. He's given us the armor of God. Let's look at Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. In my name they shall speak with new tongues. In my name they shall take up serpents. Let me stop there for a moment. Remember, serpents represents the devil and demonic forces. And he's not talking about us being snake handlers. That, that is absolutely a false religion. He's telling us we can take them to task with his name. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Well, what would be a, death, a deadly thing to us? Poison. Right? Poison would be. And unfortunately, in some circles, there's a lot of poison coming from our pulpits. We may go to a service without knowing who's preaching. Somebody's invited us, okay, we're doing a friend's favor. We get there and all of a sudden, poison coming out of the pulpit. But here's the point the Lord's making in his name. That's not going to hurt you. Depends on how we listen to it and how we react to it. I was invited to a service a number of years ago. This pastor called me. He says, I've got, a, I've got an evangelist here. I want you to come and I want you to be in the service and listen to this. This was, this was he already been there a couple of nights. Well, I went. Lynn and I both went. Well, uh, from the actions, you would think, man, this is some preacher. That man was flying all over the building. He was up and down off the platform. He's yelling and screaming and shouting. And yet there was no truth to anything he said. He's quoting portions of Scripture. You ask me why I sit here and read the Bible when we're here. I want to know exactly what's being said from the Bible. Amen. 
Well, then he gets through all this and, and telling the people that they're nothing, that they have nothing, they can't be anything, they're, they're just, you know, we're just so unworthy and all this. Power to have. And then he gets, stands in front of everybody and says, now, I'm going to have a healing line. If you want to be healed tonight, come along here. Not one person will know. Pastor looked at me and he kind of like, what do I do? Get up there and tell him to sit down. Well, he did. He got up and told the man to sit down. The man went to sit down. And the pastor rebuked his message. And he said, Brother Jerry, when you come up, you got anything to say? Well, I didn't rebuke the man or put him down. That pastor did that. He's a pastor of the church. I just gave him the truth. That by his stripes, that Jesus said, we are healed. Amen. Amen. I sent my word to heal your diseases. That's all I said. And the pastor said, now, if anybody wants to be healed, come on up front. I, I think three quarters of the church was up front. It was a big church. Really. And so we're praying for these people, and all of a sudden, told me about the sickness that had attacked his body. And so we both prayed for him. And he asked the pastor for his forgiveness. They shut down the meetings at that point. But see, you can have somebody like that helper, and they don't know any better than giving you poison, but it's not going to hurt you. And also, there's poison coming out of the politicians and the news media. It's not going to hurt us. All right? Why? We have the name of Jesus. We have what he's doing here is he's saying, in my name you're going to do these things, and you're going to speak with new tongues, and there's a couple of layers to that. We're going to speak in the tongue of the Holy Ghost, but we're also going to speak in the tongue of the Word of God. Amen. Amen. When sickness tries to attack our body, we now speak in the word of God, by his stripes I am healed. Amen. And we're going to start doing that by faith. And that sickness is going to leave your body. Amen. We have, think of this, we've got the power of attorney from Jesus. Now, just think in these terms for a moment. What would it be like financially if Bill Gates called you and says, I'm giving you the power, the power of attorney over my bank accounts? The man's worth, what, 50 or 60 million dollars? But it's going to give you the power of attorney for his bank account, which means you can tap into his money however and how often and wherever you want. That's what the power of attorney does. We've got some higher than Bill Gates, folks. Hallelujah. We've got the name of Jesus. Amen. That is a name that every knee shall bow to, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Well, let me say this. That gives us access to God's bank account. It gives us access to God's medicine. Amen. It gives us access to God's wisdom and His knowledge for us to use. That's what that power of attorney does. That's I only use this word. That's 
stop using this word for anything else but God. That's awesome. Because to me, God is awesome. And there isn't much compares to Him. Amen. So, we have all that, but we also have the power of His blood. Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. By the way, if you're looking, that's the last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 5. Verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred, every tongue, and people, and nations. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter what nation you come out of. You, when you accept Jesus Christ, are redeemed. Amen. And you're redeemed from the curse of the law. That's what a redemption is. It's a redemption from the curse of the law. And this is the power of Jesus' blood that he shed. It has redeemed us. It paid the price for our sins and our own doing. Look at verse 10. And it has made us unto, unto our God, kings and priests, we shall reign on the earth. That blood has put us in a position to receive the authority, the armor, the name to be used so that we can rule and reign in this earth. <coughs> the church is supposed to be doing that. Now, we rule and reign on this earth today. Let's find out what we can do with that. You got a few more minutes? Yeah. All right. Let's go to Mark 11, 23. Mark 11, 23. And around here, we're pretty familiar with this scripture. Let's read verse 23. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Have faith in God. Well, that's a good, good idea. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. So we have the ability to move mountains. Well, that might be a little big for you. Let's go over to um, Luke 17. Luke 17. Luke 17, verse 6. And the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. So if you got problems thinking you can't move a mountain, you can move a tree. <laughs> Hello. What is he talking about here? He, he's not really talking about us moving mountains and trees. He's talking us to us about any obstacle in your path to the better abundant life, you can command it to go into the sea and it's out of your way. We've got that much power and authority in the name of Jesus. Amen. We can do it. So, my thought is, as the body of Christ, we can take back our nation. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 
because it's a nation under God. Yes. The church has got to rise up and determine who's going to take it back. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Go to Mark chapter 16. Matthew 24. And as much as 
I would like God's word to say so. He apparently hasn't said so because we're still here. But we're here to change the environment of this world. Amen. And that's what we're looking here over the next, and I, I know it's going to be months, looking at changing our environment by changing our lives, by changing our thought patterns, developing our soul, and at the same time our spirit. We are to be like Jesus. Ephesians 5 says we are to follow him, which means imitate him. We're to act like him. Well, what do you think? You know, little Jesus? Yes. I sure do. Because we're supposed to be. We are also, according to Hebrews chapter 2, we are ambassadors for Christ. What does it mean to be a, an ambassador? See, we got this all messed up. We're sending people out from America as ambassadors to other, to other countries. They're representing themselves, not America. Hello. We are to represent Jesus in this world. We're ambassadors. And when the world looks at us, they should see Jesus. When we send an ambassador out here, and it used to be that way, we sent an ambassador to another country. That ambassador represented the United States of America to its fullest. You got too many people walking around in positions that they hold using their own opinion instead of following our Constitution. Folks, we've got to stop walking around in this physical body and showing the world something other than what's in the Bible. We are to represent the Word of God and show them the Word of God. And let me tell you, when you start doing that, you will be persecuted. Jesus said, persecution comes through the Word of God. To steal it, to take it out of you. So, we just got to ignore what the world is saying about us and be what God wants to say about us. Start verse 16, Matthew 28, 16. Then the eleven disciples went again into the mountains into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw Jesus, they worshipped Jesus, but some doubted. Even some of the eleven who had walked around with him in this earth, they still doubted him. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Jesus is telling us that same thing right now. I am with you. I'm with you. Lord. He's not standing against us. He's with us. We've got him with us 24-7. We can be who and what he was every day. Amen? So, here's the question. Why the covenant? Look at you, okay. We go on over, we'll be here another hour. No, I'm going to tell you next week. Why the covenant? Why did God make a covenant with man who had turned against him? Was, I mean, Israel was doing some of the most foolish things. They needed an idol, so they melted down gold and made a calf out of it and were worshiping it. I mean, it's just on and on. Why did God make a covenant? We're going to look at that next week. Thank you for joining us. I pray and hope 
with a Bible book, with an expectation that you got something out of us today. Know this. We love you. God love you. And Jesus is Lord. God bless you throughout this week. Tell somebody to